Right. Okay. Did you want to do a three dimensional problem? No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> we can. We'll, we'll get into three dimensions in chapter eight. But anyone want to guess what vector name I would give for the third dimension? I think somebody just said it very quietly. K hat. Yep, K hat. So I, J, K. Mr. I'm still stuck on the vector unit. Why would it be one? Because I don't, if I made it some other magnitude, like two, because really what's going on here is I'm multiplying five newtons times this. If this were at a magnitude of two, then suddenly the magnitude of this whole thing would be 10. ten. And we're trying to keep it simple. Okay. Unit vectors that look far more complex than what we've done right here, that's senior level, graduate level physics. And I don't want to go there. At least not until week seven. Are all unit vectors one, or is it semi-collective? All unit vectors for this course and for any foreseeable physics course that you will take, unless you major in physics. Uh, well, no, actually, even then, magnitude of unit vectors always one. Because we're not really trying to change the unit. I mean, the, the, the new one. Right. The only thing, the whole purpose of unit vector is to tell you direction. But since it is a vector, we've got to give it some magnitude, and one makes life simple. Because multiplying by one, I can do in my sleep. Of course, if I'm sleeping, it might come out as gibberish, but, you know, the thought process, I don't consider. Other questions right now? All right, so let's take this and make and throw some math into it because I think there's a strong demand to have more math. <laughs> so we have this, again, the situation here. We've got five newtons this way, three newtons that way. If instead I ask, what is the magnitude of the force? Shorthand for magnitude of force. We throw a question mark in there just so that it's what is the magnitude of the force. I could have also written this as just F equals. Now we're dealing with, I have to do something with that right there. So adding vectors. I will talk you through the head to tail method. Now my head was down when you said adding that. What was, what was that? And, and it said adding vectors. Uh, or we're, well, we're going to add those two together. Oh, okay. Hewitt goes into the parallelogram method. I will talk about that, and I will also talk about why I don't care for the parallelogram method. But uh, I'll, so I'll start out with head to tail, and then talk about how that looks a whole lot like parallelogram method, unless you're adding more than two vectors. All right, so if I had a drawing vector, this is our representation of a vector. This is the head, and that is the tail. The arrow points in the direction of the vector, because again, vectors have direction and a magnitude. So it has a particular direction and it has a particular length. So the length. Corresponds probably 
corresponds to magnitude. And direction is equal to direction. I know that's going to really mess with your heads, but just trust me, direction is equal to direction. So in the first example that we did where I had the 5 Newton, the 5 Newton and the 3 Newton force pushing on the box in the same direction, the way I would do head to tail is I'd start with one of the vectors and it does not matter which one. I start with one of the vectors and let's just assume that that is 5 Newtons and it's pointing to the right. And now you're about to see some stunning, absolutely spectacular visual effects as we use another color. I'm going to add to it three. So I go, I started here, I go to the end, and now I take my three Newtons and I add the three Newtons to it. Yeah, more than one cover. My final answer, my sum of these two vectors is from where I started to where I ended. So it's five newtons to the right plus three newtons to the right is eight newtons to the right. Or so the visual of what we've done already. I think number lines when you first start doing addition is basically number line stuff. That next example, I had five newtons going to, or a later example, five newtons to the right and three newtons to the left. I start with one of the two vectors, doesn't matter which one. This time I'll start with a three. I, I pick my starting point. I draw one that's three newtons long. Now, I'm here. I draw my five newton vector, which is to the right. And my resultant where I started to where I ended. And that's two newtons to the right. Now in a one-dimensional problem, it's a whole lot easier just to go five minus three is two. But we're setting up for two dimensions. Questions before we hit the two dimensions? So I'm going to draw one that's five newtons long. Plus three, well three's going that way. So my resultant, from where I started to where I ended, my resultant is that. This is my sum. otherwise known as the resultant. And this is the one time I used the double print for the, for my vector symbol. Again, for some childhood star. Now, in physics 151 and 251 and 131, you're gonna to have to figure out what that angle is. Physics 110, no. But the magnitude of this, you should be able to do. You can handle that. This is a right angle. And so if I, so I've got a right triangle here. How do you find the hypotenuse of a right triangle if you know the two legs? Three squared plus five squared is equal to R squared. So it's nine plus 25 is equal to r squared. 34 is equal to r squared. The magnitude of my resultant, which I could have written as absolute value symbol around my vector symbol, is whatever the square root of 34 is. Okay. 
you know, let people catch up on the right end, then I'm gonna talk about a mistake that's on the board. It's nothing that you'll have to erase. Will we have to simplify that anymore if it's an irrational number? Can we just keep root 34 in our answer? I, I would accept root 34. If you've got a square root in a square root, you know, something like that, I, I, not more than one fraction bar per numeric answer and per unit, and not more than one radical per answer. Questions up to here before I talk about why you would lose points if you answer, if you stop right there. All right. What's missing? If you if you did this and you came up with that answer on a ten point problem, you'd lose three points. Uh, all I've asked for is the magnitude here, so don't need direction. This is physics. This is not math class. This is one of those places where physicists care, and mathematicians are more of a you know, whatever. Don't forget units in your answer. It'll become second nature to some of you, and some of you will have to keep being reminded. Or this class is gonna be different. This is the one where I don't have to remind people. You will all know. This is gonna be the best class ever. Yes. Thank you. So we can stop at 34? Excuse me? So we're supposed to stop at 34 because I thought we were supposed to do it. No, no, you're supposed to put units in there. I know. Okay. Well, uh, as far as the question that I asked was, what's the magnitude of the resultant? And so, yes, you would stop there. Because all I asked for was the magnitude. Okay. To figure out what that angle is, you would either need to draw it very carefully on a piece of paper and measure it or use trig. And this is not a trig-based course unless you want it to be. Okay. There seem to be some visceral reactions to that. What's that? All right, so we got one in favor of it. There was a 110 instructor years ago who started teaching trig and did law of sines and law of cosines. And there were a lot of blank looks that I saw from students. I'm not going to subject you to it. For those who do know how to use trig, or occasionally I get a calculus student in here, uh, feel free to do the more advanced, advanced math techniques if you want. All right. Now, one more bit before we actually get more into forces. I have two vectors on the board. I'm gonna call this vector A and vector B. I will say they both represent a force. Which is a greater force? Why? And it's as simple as that. We can come up with some estimate of how much bigger it is. If B is that long, that's one, two. A looks like it's, if, assuming my fingers did not twitch a little bit there, A seems to be a little bit less than three times the magnitude of B. I guess properly spoken, I, I did leave some words out there. The magnitude of A is, seems like it's a little bit less than three times the magnitude of B. So when you're doing the graphic method, when I'm drawing up these things and adding them up that way, Here, I know I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem, it was less crucial, but there is a lab, a force table lab, where you need to be, you come up with a scale, you figure out how long you need to draw it, and you have to be incredibly precise as you do it. I'm going to throw a third one in there.
All right, so we want to add up these three vectors. I start with one of them. It really does not matter which one I start with. For the same reason as 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2. The order in which you add them does not matter. For those who are into math vocabulary, the commutative property addition holds with vectors. All right, so I'm going to start with A because it's, why not? So I'm going to draw that vector. Now this should be the same length as that, and it should be pointing in the exact same direction. Hopefully it's close enough. Let's see, can I get more than a spin? Hopefully that's a little bit closer. Then I take the second, then I take another vector. I'm going to take C this time, and I'm going to draw that one. Again, head to tail, so I'm at the head of the first one, and then I draw, that becomes the tail of the second one. That one's A and C. And then I add this third one here, B. In which direction is the resultant? The point in the air. In which direction is the resultant? I'm getting several different answers. Up and right. So I got it up and right, I've got up and left, and I got towards the board. Mm -hmm. I don't know if someone is just pointing. Um, well, I guess the resultant would be the little, the little piece. It depends on what you mean by little piece. Well, the little piece from the A and from the, the, the B. Little piece. Oh, 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 the connecting between A and B? OK. And there was a question back there? No, I was just asking, like, what was the question? The uh, question is, what is the direction of the resultant? In okay. other words, the direction of the sum. Would you draw a line from the start of A to the end of B? B. That be the and that is the same thing we did before, from the beginning to the end. Yeah. So I started here, yeah. and I end up there. That's my result of it. I was trying to close it off, but then. <laughs> yeah, the most common mistake here for people to recognize, well, at least I need to connect it, uh, is to go in the other direction. So it's going this way. Yes. Okay. From where you begin to where you end. You can think about it this way. There's, uh, we've been dealing with forces here. I can do the exact same problem except different context. These are displacements. So instead of forces, they're displacements, which is also a vector quantity. So you start out at home, and you walk off in that direction for however far that is, and then you stop, and then you walk south, however far that is, and then you walk northwest, however far that is, where are you relative to where you started? In other words, if someone needed to get you from home, how would they have to travel? Well, they started here, they end there. Right. The resultant is basically where you end up relative to where you started. The math is identical between the, the two scenarios that I laid out, with the forces and with displacements. Other questions right now? All right, this seems like a nice place to take a break, stretch legs, whatever you need to do. We'll come back in about five minutes and we'll talk more specifically about the types of forces. We'll get in more detail with the forces themselves. And this stuff will keep popping up again and again. All right. Any questions before we start talking about rules of dealing with forces? Getting more into the meat of chapter two.
All right, so there are not a lot of statements I can make in physics where the word always is appropriate, but I'm going to go ahead and say that forces always come in pairs. This is one of those few always. And when you're talking about the forces in that pair, the forces in that pair always are anti-parallel. Usually you see the term anti-parallel showing up in context outside of physics, but it's not necessarily a term that people use. Parallel vectors are ones that point in the same direction. Anti-parallel point in opposite directions. And always act on different objects. These will be explained in more detail as we go on today. So when dealing with physics, being able to analyze a situation, figure out what forces are acting on it, what type of forces are they, becomes really something that we are doing throughout the entire course. And so I came up with <coughs> sort of a checklist here of I'm going to go ahead and say five. You might go with four on this, but five forces that we will constantly be running into again and again. As additional forces are added, we'll just throw in a couple extra letters there. So the first one, friction. That's that first F. The symbol 